Welcome to another edition of the Litigation Psychology Podcast brought to you by Courtroom Sciences. I am Dr. Bill Kanaski. Um, if you are watching on the YouTube channel, check out the new backdrop. We have remodeled the podcast studio. It's badass. Okay, badass. Um, much better than we had before. And, um, you know, what can I say? We got to, you always got to upgrade if you want to be, uh, if you want to be good in anything. So uh, we have a great episode today. Uh, and we're doing something a little bit different today. I have three attorneys from the same law firm. And I think it's important to uh, talk to law firms, talk to uh, different attorneys, get the word out there to spread the word about, because, you know, different law firms do different things. Different law firms have different philosophies, different attorneys within law, you know, law firms have different philosophies. And everybody typically comes from a little bit of a unique background. So I think that's that's going to be interesting. So I have three attorneys here today from the firm of Roberts, Carroll, Feldstein, and Pierce out of Providence, Rhode Island. Now, claim the fame of Providence, Rhode Island is this is where one of my favorite movies is based, Something About Mary. Okay, so that's 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 like when I think Providence, I'm, I'm not thinking law firms. I'm thinking, yeah, I'm thinking um Ben Stiller and something uh, something about Mary. And I have um, uh, Jeff Oates. Jeff, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, Bill. Thanks for having us on. Outstanding. Uh, Jason Precepts. Hi, thank you. Thanks for coming on. And Kristen Petty. Kristen, Hi. how are you today? Good, thank you. Thanks for having us. All right. I think this is going to be a pretty cool discussion because uh, I, I'm in the very unique position in this industry being a witness prep expert and a jury consultant is I, I work with a ton of different attorneys and firms all year, every year, not for 23 years. And boy, there's there's a bunch of variants. There's a bunch of differences. You know, um, when I work from firm to firm, some firms uh, I work with are, are pretty, I want, for lack of a better term, I guess, pigeonholed, or let's put it this way. They're very focused. Maybe they only do trucking litigation, right? Or some firms only do med mal, or some firms only do business litigation. Well, other firms are are more diverse. They kind of they kind of mix it up. Kristen, can you kind of give us a background uh, on the firm and and the and the types of different cases that you all handle? Sure, we're actually a pretty diverse firm. Uh, we have a wide range of cases that we do, from medical malpractice defense to healthcare to commercial lending, estates and trusts, domestic and family law, landlord tenant. Uh, and other business contracts and civil litigation generally all around. It doesn't just need to be insurance defense. We do also have some plaintiff's cases. Jason, I think, did I cover all the list? I think so. Instruction was the last thing on my desk yesterday. Uh, IP litigation is always fun. That's a headache. And, uh... No, that's not fun. Jason, come on. <laughs> you have to, okay, the one rule in the litigation psychology podcast is you got to be honest. Oh, oh come oh, on. It's not fun. I still have a headache from the last one I did 10 years ago. What is or what is not a trade secret, doctor? <laughs> oh gosh. I'm not I have a little PTSD flashbacks. I, I let Dr. Steve Wood handle the IP stuff because he's got the brain for it. I don't have quite the patience or the attention span for it. Now I tell you what, good good story. The last time I was actually in Delaware and we did a big mock trial on an IP case. These poor mock jurors. You thought it was like Chinese water torture at one point or waterboarding <laughs> at, at Gitmo. It was, I felt so bad for these people because they're looking at all this art and this is, oh God, it's very, very difficult uh, uh, types of cases. Uh, Jason, tell me, tell me about, tell me about how being a, a firm that's so diverse, that handles so many different types um, of litigation, how is that a strength for your law firm as opposed to maybe some other law firms that only handle one thing? Oh, sure. Well, uh, we've been here since 1971. And so there was this broad tradition from the founding of the firm of having a different group of people come together who were doing different things. Um, but one thing that we have in common is our staff. So the ability to walk up and down the hall and grab the person who you may think knows nothing about your particular case whether it's a lawyer, a paralegal, a legal assistant, uh, the bookkeeper, run some facts by them and uh, just get a, a sounding board from a group of people who've 
been here largely for decades and have heard a lot of different types of cases come in and come out, seen a lot of jury verdicts, uh, yeah. um, settlements, fun discovery disputes where we're coming back from court and saying some unkind words about things that might be going on um, and, and give you perspective. So I, I think there's strength in the diversity and it also helps us connect with different members in the Rhode Island Bar which we, you know, we're all in this same pond. There are a large number of attorneys in Rhode Island. You might not know. I, I don't know what the stats are now, but we were, I think, per capita, the largest number of attorneys per, you know, individual population of a state. Wow. Hmm. Wow. You throw a rock and hit an attorney in uh, Rhode Island, it sounds like. Uh, that or Dunkin' Donuts. Yeah. <laughs> now, another claim to fame is when I was uh, departing the University of Florida and graduating, I had already accepted a job uh, in the litigation psychology um, sector. And as I was leaving, uh, Brown University called me because I was a prolific researcher in the areas of like exercise uh, adherence and dietary behavior and stuff like that. Uh, this was around you know the year 2000, 2001, 2002. And they called me and they offered me a big job at Brown to be a researcher. And I had to say, ah, thanks, but no thanks. That was kind of hard. But, but I did I did go there. Uh, and Brown's a fantastic, um, fantastic university. Uh, uh, very nice place. Unfortunately, I was uh, I went to Brown and visited in um, January. Mm. January, not the best time uh, to mm. be in Rhode Island. Uh, but uh, I need I need to go back. I, I need to go back now. Please now right. again. I'm just going to go off on tangents. Like, are you all Red Sox fans? Do we really have to go here? Is it is that really how this goes? Or what, like, what does it mean? So, if you're in Rhode Island because you don't have a pro team, like, what? Yeah. Where's your Where's the alliance here locally? I mean, come on. We're Patriots. We're Red Sox. <laughs> we're Bruins. Um, and yeah, personally, no, I for the we're best Celtics. years of my life at Brown. So I, I regret you that you weren't able to come and. Uh, you know, join join the faculty there, or that's okay. That's okay. But it would it would it would it, it would have been fun. And by the way, um, I I am a proud graduate uh, undergrad uh, at, from the University of North Carolina. And my boy Drake May uh, sent that game in the overtime this weekend, but then threw a, a really bad pick at the end. So he's he's a rookie. He's gonna get there. But I am on the. I may have to buy myself a Pats jersey with the uh, Drake May um, on the back. Now, Jeff. How is now, I, now, Jeff? We talked a little bit about your uh, uh, your background uh, over email, and we've connected on LinkedIn. Um, you, you've got a pretty diverse uh, background. You got some government stuff going on, some criminal stuff, some appellate stuff. How does um, now in my in in my mind, I, I think that's pretty some of the best trial attorneys that I have ever seen in my life. When I've got to know them, they told me kind of how they came up. And so many of the the very best ones I have seen have come like very very diverse backgrounds. Um, that not you 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 think wow this is a great civil trial attorney, but then you look at their background, it's like they had some government stuff or they had some criminal stuff. How does that diverse background help you as a as a younger attorney and and trying to grow within the firm? Well, it certainly helps in the sense of connecting to people. Um, and the ability to connect to clients, potential clients, court staff, um, other attorneys, the people I work with, no matter their background and what the, where they come from and what they believe. And so I think, uh, you know, that's going to go a long way in just furthering my career because of all those experiences I've had, whether it's nonprofit, uh, government, or uh, legal work. Um, it's involved diverse populations and trying to connect with people and get jobs done together uh, rather than working in our silos. So now is it fair to say the current position is a little bit more fun and dynamic than the government and criminal stuff? What do you, th what do you think? It is. It's been a lot of fun <laughs> uh, getting going here and, and I pinch myself every day. Uh, I feel very lucky and uh, working with, Jason and Kristen and, you know, some of the other attorneys on staff here. Um, yeah, I got to pinch myself every day. So it's been 
it's been a lot of fun and it is, it's very different, you know, in some respects, but also similar as far as approaching issues and cases and, yeah. and matters that come across your desk. Yeah, that that's fantastic. So it sounds like, it sounds like you found a good spot. Um, Kristen, the, uh, a, this is a question, it's actually a controversial question because it's a topic that's come up in my travels and particularly when I'm doing, I, I do a lot of public speaking at seminars and state bar associations. The defense has had a significant problem with both recruiting young attorneys and retaining young attorneys. How does your firm try to be attractive for the young attorney? Because I think one of the problems is that we see on the defense side is a lot of very talented associates bouncing around a lot and not really getting that longevity and that um, stability early in their career. And they're bouncing a lot around. And, and, may, and, and listen, I bet I only changed jobs once um, and it was necessary because courtroom sciences was the better fit for me. So people change jobs because it's a better fit. But I think it's an extraordinary amount of bouncing around by associates uh, in this day and age. Uh, a lot of it's financially based. And um, how, how do you guys handle that issue? Because I think that's a very important issue going forward. Sure. No, that is a very important issue because you want to attract talent and then you want to keep talent. And in keeping the talent, you make an investment that you hope to see a return on. And frankly, and this sounds so old fashioned, but it really comes down to relationship building. Yeah. Because you can always hop around and yes, get a bigger, better deal. But if you like where you're at and you're demonstrated and you feel as if you're valuable and part of a team, then that really does go a long way to keep young talent. And don't get me wrong, we've had people who have gone on to other places and it was a better fit for their situation or otherwise. But candidly, we some of our attorneys have been with our office for decades. I've been at the office for more than 20 years and Jason has as well. And we have other attorneys that this is was their first and only job. So we yeah. do try to treat each other as family and get to know each other and also provide an opportunity for growth and having the flexibility for young families, because you said young talent. And yeah. that's really hard. And COVID really opened up the door to show us what we can do in the office and outside of the office. And as opposed to billable hour grind, although that's important as much as we don't want to admit it, we do appreciate the fact that letting our attorneys be available for their families, that's key and critical. If they're happy at home, they'll be more productive at work. Yeah, that's that's really fantastic. Um, so, Jason, uh, now Krista said the word uh, growth. I was going to ask about that. Um, you guys, uh, you're not a huge law firm, right? But you seem very um, you know, interconnected and have really good chemistry. I think sometimes gro growth is kind of tricky, right? And here at Courtrooms, it's the same thing because sometimes you grow, it can get a little out of control. And if you're too small, it limits your revenue. What's the firm's like, what's the philosophy on, on growth? Because it, I think it's really hard. I do, I do know this for a fact. I think it's, it's hard to find good people and you can grow too fast, which may help on revenue, but then you create, maybe you can create some other problems too, right? I think our philosophy is serve the client and do great work. And we've been lucky. Uh, I, I mean, you you can work as hard as you can with a plan. You're, you're going to need some luck. We've definitely had luck on our side. Um, but I think what we've developed are some significant institutional clients in both healthcare, banking, and, and other industries that have really appreciated the relationships we've built with them and the work we've done for them. And then the growth has just followed through building of a, a reputation and and uh, our our attorneys are also very much engaged in the community. Um, so I, I, I can't name the number of hats I'm wearing in the community oh. between volunteer fire force to elder care organization to state commission. And when you're out there and, and people get to know you. Mm -hmm. They're likely to, to think of you. And when you get that phone call, there's that opportunity for growth. And so we just have to periodically assess, are we right-sized staff-wise for the level of work that we're generating? 
-hmm. and make sure that we keep that balance um, so that we can continue to give excellent service to clients and and not at the same time feel you know overwhelmed with yeah. with tasks that are uh, you know we're increasingly in a world where we're all working inside the office outside the office where you're remotely connected through the cloud and our phones clients are texting us calling us um you just learn to balance it all and, and figure out how to bring a plan together where because we're working as a team you can pull someone else in if in a given moment you don't have the bandwidth yeah now jeff as as a as a younger attorney and you know gaining valuable experience uh, at the firm uh, with 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 your colleagues and i think this the answer may be different for different types of attorneys um, is it something where you're looking to get experience in multiple areas of litigation or is, is, is the goal for you to essentially pick a healthcare or banking or whatever it is and, 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 and end up kind of being a, a specialist as time goes on? Well, it's interesting though. I, I think a lot of attorneys, uh, older attorneys would tell you to specialize early and often. Yeah. I don't necessarily believe that. Um, but I just view my role, uh, and I viewed my role as a law clerk in this way and as an associate is how I can be helpful to the firm and to the partners. So for me, I don't, I don't, uh, um, I didn't come in and I wouldn't expect to be able to make a demand about what kind of work I will, <laughs> will, will get. And will uh, um, I, I just try to be helpful and I'm open to take anything. And I think as I build my own career and reputation, um, and build trust, frankly. Yeah. Then I can start to think about how I want to focus in and and possibly narrow that that practice area. Yeah, excellent. So, Kristen, back to you. Mm -hmm. Another kind of big struggle that comes up again at these seminars and, and, and meetings that I go to, um, usually uh, you know, on the defense side, is they say. I'm trying to, these are typically like managing partners, right? People with 20 years mm -hmm. plus, they're saying, I, I am trying to develop these younger attorneys and these clients won't let us, like they always want me, right? And I'm trying to get them more experience and the client either doesn't want to pay for it or they always want me. How do you, I think this is a really important question for our audience. How do you communicate to the client the importance of the team development, particularly with the associates and getting them on board for the bigger picture, because you know, as well as I do, as your associates grow, they get better, they get more experience. I mean, you know, guys like Jeff for the future, right? Whereas yeah. some of these clients are just thinking either dollar signs or thinking about this particular case. How do you have that discussion with the client to, to ensure that uh, you guys are philosophically on the same page with your relationship in the long term? Sure. That's a good question too, because in, um, in follow-up to Jason's commentary that, you know, we've been around since 1971. If we didn't, in our prior partners and lawyers didn't have that conversation with our clients, we certainly wouldn't still be here because that's the way things work. So we're fortunate in that we have some institutional clients who recognize that growth is required and yeah. that they want to see the up and coming because they want to continue to work with us knowing that we're going to continue to instill the philosophy that we have and they're happy with that philosophy and they want to ensure that they have bodies coming up in the ranks to continue to deliver the good service and that's certainly important growth absolutely is important but you don't want to grow too fast too quick because then you potentially sacrifice the quality mm -hmm. of the service so you don't want to do that so you need to have the conversations with the clients to say this is how it works for you. This is why it's beneficial. This ensures, one, it's a cost-saving measure because there are some things, younger partners and younger lawyers, their hourly rate is going to be less. So that's important. We always sell the team approach to ensure that when they have questions, they can get a body and they don't just have to resort to email. Don't get me wrong. Some people are always on email, but on the flip side, some people still like a good old fashioned, pick up the phone and talk to somebody. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. It also allows us to vary our delivery, our service, the services that we can deliver. So we can develop presentations and we can, you know, reach out because we have the bodies to do it. So all of that is key. 
but and sometimes it just involves having a hard conversation with yeah. a client <laughs> and say, uh, for example, we had a very involved trial coming up and it was huge. And there, one attorney had been managing it for years. But realistically, that is not practical and that's not a way to deliver the best service to the clients. So we need to have a team. And at that point in time, we talk to them and say, we want to bring on other people. Mm -hmm. And hopefully yeah. you've developed the trust with the client where they say, we trust you, do what you deem is appropriate to defend us in the best possible fashion. And then you go that route. So it's a combination. It's a multi factorial approach mm -hmm. to building relationships, creating trust and demonstrating how it's valuable to the client. Excellent. So Jeff, a two part question here. So looking at your, your background and, and now you're kind of, you know, you jumped in with both feet in civil litigation uh, and it seemed like you're at a great firm. So congratulations. What, what's maybe one thing about civil litigation that maybe caught you off guard that you were surprised with once once you kind of jumped in with both feet like oh wow i didn't didn't know that and then secondarily what advice would you give to other young attorneys trying to grow and, and develop uh, at this kind of the same level you are i would say one thing that was surprising was um i think it's a it's a, a more significant amount of um how should i put this like uh legal law work that you're doing um, whereas I view criminal more investigatory and maybe mm -hmm. more um, babysitting. You've got to have those soft <laughs> skills. Yeah, those soft yeah. skills uh, might be a little more important in dealing with uh, clients or witnesses. Um, whereas civil litigation, if, if you got to be in court sometimes, but if really all you love is, is the, the research and the legal writing and the, the legal sort of minutiae, the stuff a lot of litigators may find boring, mm -hmm. um, if you really love that, then then it'll it'll go great. I mean, I think that was maybe surprising, and just the way the rules interact. You really got to know the rules and and be respectful of them, and and um, and yeah, you got to love the research. Really, is what it comes down to. And as far as for younger attorneys, it goes back to a little bit of what I was just saying in regards to you have to love the boring stuff. <laughs> and sometimes you have to embrace, right. yeah, and, and you have to embrace the suck um, at some time. So, um, and just to be open and a little bit of what I said earlier, and, and just you got to view your role as a young associate, a young law clerk, um, as just being helpful in any way you can um, until you establish yourself and can um, sort of build your own uh, sort of niche. Yeah, em embracing the suck is now. now I'm just going to tell you right now, um, which I know. I think three of the four of us are in the same ballpark, or maybe I'm just the old guy. I mean, I I'm a Gen Xer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I was raised. Yeah, I was raised a certain way, and um, and it was a lot of toughness. And yeah, my what my football coaches did to us would would be they'd all be in jail today mm -hmm. if it still happened, right? Uh, and guy, even even my my great grandmother used to get the she take her shoe off and like whack us when we were not being, I mean, we, we, we took a beating there as a, uh, as Gen Xers and the younger generations, there's this, and I do think this is true, but there's this, um, uh, there's this bad rap they get that, you know, the younger generation, like they want the corner office and the, all the money like now, mm -hmm. like there's no patience. Like they don't, they don't want to embrace the suck. They don't want to, they don't want to grind. Um, how do you, uh, I guess, mentally deal with the grind? No, like, cause you gotta be patient, right? And nobody wants to be patient. And I'm not picking on your generation, Jeff, but I'm, I'm, I am totally picking on your generation. Yeah, no, I mean, look, it's, it's, those are all good points. I, you know, my la my two offices and both clerkships in Connecticut and Rhode Island were uh, closets without air or heat, <laughs> by the way. Um, and so, but I didn't mind, you know, um, I think you got to just try and find the positives in, in whatever you're doing. And yeah. part of that, though, is a life outlook that takes time to develop. And you have to go through some adversity in life to develop that outlook. I agree. Life, um, and be thankful to just be here and be doing this job and uh, realize. And take criticism. That's the, like, giving constructive criticism yeah. to a young person right now, it's like. 
Yeah. You know, yeah, you never know well, how they're going to react. They could get up and walk out. I mean, it's not really what you want either, but it's, yeah, you got to be able to, to take criticism and you're going to meet a lot of different personalities and you have to be able to work with um, whether it's a judge that just calls you into their office randomly yeah. and says, here's this case, draw up, you know, a summary judgment decision and says nothing else. And then you, you whatever you turn back is never good enough. <laughs> um, and then there's other judges that want to sit and talk with you for 45 minutes about a case. Mm -hmm. And, um, and when you turn it in, they say, this is great. Thanks. And you never hear anything again. Um, and then other times you get a lot of feedback. So you just have to be flexible in who you're working with. And, and also, yes, realize that you're not, um, at that stage in your career where you can start making demands or, or, uh, declining work, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So, which, which is a perfect segue into my next um, question, Kristen, mm -hmm. I would, I think, I think the number one, most important thing at any firm, law firm, accounting firm, consulting firm like ours is mentoring. How does your firm, uh, what's the philosophy on mentoring and, 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 and how do you set it up to ensure, because I think a lack of mentoring is where a lot of, I think this is where the wheels can come off and bad things can happen. No, absolutely. Uh, I don't know if we actually have a formal mentoring uh, program because we're small in that sense. So, you know, back in the day, we were all assigned somebody or assigned a mentor, but now we really have sort of a team approach in yeah. that sense. And it really goes down to, I mean, mostly open door, although, you know, sometimes doors are closed because you're on speakerphone or on a podcast, yes. but, you know, other times uh, it's, it's an open door and always making yourself available. And even when you're not in the office, you are, you know, checking in and, you know, sharing information about your family and what's important to you. It goes back to one of my first comments is that it's relationship building. It's all yeah. about getting to know who people are and in the hiring process, being careful and cognizant of finding someone who fits because that is important and uh, allowing them to ask questions and be part of things and uh, reinforcing that some of the stuff is fun and some of it isn't, but it, it's bringing people in at every step of the way and I think that's really that's really the key part. Uh, let having some transparency as yeah. to what works and what doesn't. It, you know, not that people go into closed doors and there's all kinds of secrets being exchanged. If there's a question, ask it. If I can tell you, I will. If I can't, I'll tell you I can't, and I'll tell you why. I mean, all of those things are critical. Yeah. People who feel locked out of the process are not inclined to feel invested and stay, and that doesn't help anyone. Yeah, it's really communication one on one. Yeah, the other thing, Kristen, what I've seen at other firms, this is just it, it's it's happened at my firm in the past. Um, you get partners that are sometimes so super competitive, it it it, it can create problems within with within the firm, and you have rather than the teamwork, you have two people compete, or sometimes it's multiple people competing against each other. Which, again, I think you want. It's like it's like a balancing act, right? You want right. a sense of competitiveness, but you you don't want it to uh, end up, you know, screwing up the team, um, which is something that you know it's uh, that can pop up at, at firms and always a uh, a difficult issue. Okay, so those are my warm up questions. So now I'm going to get to the, now I'm getting the big stuff. I had to get warmed up. All right, mm -hmm. I got Jason teed up for my next one. This is. This is, he has no idea. By the way, we didn't choreograph any of this. This is just, I just wrote my list and you guys are getting the questions. Here's how it goes. Um, Jason, uh, the use of AI yeah. in litigation. Um, this, I think, is the number, I would rank this as the number one topic yeah. in civil litigation. Uh, I think uh, both, I think the learning curve on this is is, is, is pretty high. Uh, I think whoever figures this out, <laughs> firm by firm, is is it's going to be. I think it's going to be a, a major advantage. I think it also has some disadvantages. We've seen a couple of embarrassing news stories mm -hmm. of motions being filed where the judge is like, "Okay, this case does not exist. What the hell is going on here?" How, uh, Jason? How is your firm? Um, what have you discussed? Uh, 
about AI internally and kind of um, like what's the firm plan on how to, because there's no running away from this, number no. one. And then I see, I see the way this may go down is clients, this may be a, a, a top down integration of AI as opposed to a bottom up. Whereas clients may say, guess what? <laughs> Here's how we're doing things. You guys need to get on board. What, what, what discussions have you had and, and kind of where do you see this going? So AI can offer us potentially some efficiencies. I, I think everyone's fearful of the potential for error. So yeah. if we can back up for just a second, one of the things I do is, is teach as an adjunct professor to law students. And for the first time, feeding an exam question in a constitutional law context into AI to see what answer spit spat back out at me uh, was the most enlightening experience I had had to date with the potential for AI and how it could revolutionize what we do. Yeah. Um, you, I, I do expect that yes, it will be driven by many clients. We, we have some significant institutional clients that are using AI and also um, looking for certain efficiencies yeah. that it, it will bring, it, it eventually will drive. It's going to shift the way that we all practice. I think that um, it also offers an opportunity because uh, it's, it's not only garbage in, garbage out, but it's the same as if the product comes from any attorney or any paralegal. It's the amount of iterative work you're going to do when you get that AI product the review, the analysis, the rewrite, the checking the sources, the underlying data analysis. Um, those are all ways that I think, um, you know, our practice is not going to be changed by AI. So right now, I think we're in a sort of yellow light. Let's see what uh, what we can make of this and how we can use this to help us achieve our goals uh it's not right for everything sure. but uh for, for now uh, certain things it's great for yeah because i i again we've seen some of the embarrassing stories and um it, it makes you wonder i think maybe in some jurisdictions have come up with various rules like if you've used ai on something right you have to disclose that um boy this is the wild west who knows who knows where this is where this is where this is going to go, uh, Jeff? Is this something uh, as a younger attorney that you try? Because here's what I do. It's going to sound weird, but this is the only way I can get. I try to use it at least thirty to sixty minutes a day to just kind of or do some reading. Just do something thirty to sixty minutes a day, no matter what, to get my head around AI because I know it's coming. And when it finally gets here, I don't want to be the guy behind, way, way behind having to catch up. Um, are there some of the things maybe you do as a young attorney to either research, you know, what it's like, maybe just read up on it, or is there things that you can actually use right now that 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 maybe create some efficiencies? Um, you know, well, I'll, I'll take the the last question first. Uh, you know, I think whether it's the legal research tools that are that are coming out and improving with those things. Um, I just I was using Adobe Acrobat this week and I saw their little AI learning tool thing yeah. and you can go in there and I was like, wow. So, you know, I'm learning new stuff every day yeah. and I'm probably further behind and maybe some because I um, I've been kind of bullheaded on it. I mean, when we were this chat GPT came out when I was a law clerk and it took about a month for the judiciary to, to figure out this was a thing. And then they banned it for all for use for all law clerks. You know, none of us were using it because it was like, you don't want to turn something in like that. But, uh, you know, um, I'm, I, I try to I try to read articles and, and sort of stay aware of it. It's kind yeah. of the debate. I think that's been going on in, in multiple jurisdictions and states about with their professional rules about what what constitutes competent in um with respect to ai and whether it's okay do you just need to be aware of it aware yeah. of the changes and what's going on or do you need to actually know how to use it um 
And if the states and the courts start saying you need to know how to use it, I think a lot of attorneys are going to be a little behind on that because it's changing so fast. Um, you know, and you I imagine know. from a, a um, at some point from a from a, a firm marketing strategy, I think you're going to start seeing defense firms market to say, "Hey, our firm, like we've got it." Because here's here's what I think. I think for this again, I'm I can't predict the future, but I'm I'm a pretty damn good guesser. I think firms may end up hiring in-house like an AI expert to just have in-house to help them and then maybe use that as a marketing tool to not just to get more work from current clients, but maybe to advertise to new clients saying, hey, we are ahead of the curve. We are ahead of the curve and try to bring in more business like that. So it's going to be interesting how this whole AI thing um, plays out, how it's used internally, how it's used by the clients. And uh, there's a lot of question. <laughs> there's a lot of question marks going there. Um, now, Kristen, as you, as everybody knows, we're in this, you know, nuclear age of just, you know, insane, crazy verdicts. <laughs> um, I have some very strong opinions on this because I pretty much give speeches on this every week. Um, they are, they are anomalies. Uh, nuclear verdicts aren't happening every day. It's, uh, it's nuclear settlements. I think are much, much more expensive. And bigger problem. And if you talk to insurance people that know what they talk about, they will tell you it's not the big ones they're they're worried about. It's the stockpiling of the the smaller and medium ones that exponentially they have smaller numbers per case, but they multiply. And when you you're seeing uh, settlements that are happening over case value, multiply it out. That turns out to be a, a much more staggering number. Than one of these, you know, crazy verdicts you see. That's that's typically either overturned on appeal, or is cut down, or 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 is settled. So, uh, so Chris, I guess the question is: when you're talking to your clients, what what is a win? Because because I I I think probably 20 years ago, 25 years ago, and in the past, maybe even as soon, maybe even 10 years ago or 15 years ago. I think a win in a case, particularly when there was a lot of trials, was going to trial and getting a favorable verdict, right? So much has changed. You know, 95 to 98% of these cases are settling. When you're talking to your clients, how are you talking to them as far as defining what a, what a real win is? Because it's not necessarily getting a, a verdict at this point. Not necessarily. So with that, I guess it certainly depends on the client. Yeah. Um, in that regard, if you're dealing with an individual, and I'm just as assuming that we're talking in the med mal field, the medical malpractice yeah, yeah, sure. field. So, I mean, if if we're in the medical malpractice field and you have an individual doctor, then a, a win would be uh, having a complete dismissal because yeah. having any type of settlement <laughs> results in a reporting to the National Practitioner Data Bank and a reporting to the applicable Department of Health or the licensing agency. And then there's reciprocity across other states. And so given in this sort of global world, a lot of docs have licenses in different states. So then that means they're going to be battling uh, across state lines for something that occurred in one state because there's that reciprocity. So that's one bit. Putting aside the dismissal, which, you know, that's an ideal situation. Certainly it mm -hmm. happens and we still get them and we still get them even for discovery purposes or otherwise. A win would be getting out in an economically palatable fashion. So within yeah. the uh, reserves and within the acceptable amount of liability that has been put on by the carrier in the hospital with also, and I'll add this because I'm also seeing an increase in um, press so, and have absolutely no impact. So you want no footprint out there. You yeah. want no headline. You want no interview. You want no reference, nothing on social media, all that. And a comfortable and negotiated confidentiality provision where the one who's getting paid and walking away with the money is not putting anything big, bold, or um, identifying in their advertisements I mean, I guess all in all, that's the that's the best possible. And also minimizing the impact on the involved practitioners because we don't talk about that, but these things take a serious toll on the practitioners who are involved. Even if a payment doesn't happen on them, it's like a hurry up 
hurry up to wait situation. You oh, have yeah. to file within a certain amount of time, but then these docs are stuck in the, or the nurses or the other medical professionals, they're stuck. They know a case is out there. They're helpless because they can't move it along and it weighs on them and the people who care about them and their practice. So to minimize that stress as well, I think it all goes into, it all goes into a win. Yeah. Jason, how do you deal with a client? Because I see this a lot. So like I get hired a lot. You know, half of what I do is is, is getting these, a lot of med, you know, medical folks, you know, ready for both deposition and, tra and trial testimony and the, the emotional challenges to that. That's really, the other half of my job is 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 studying jury decision-making research. Yeah. And oftentimes we are hired uh, and earlier the better um, when an entity thinks, you know what, this is a bullshit case. We ain't, we ain't given these MFers a nickel, right? And then the trial attorney is like, eh, I'm not so sure about that. And so <laughs> we we get hired and uh, we do a lot of uh, early, what we call early case assessment focus groups to get like a jury read on what do they think about the basic facts of this case? What do they think about? We have a couple of video clips of our witnesses. Maybe, maybe have a day in the life. Like what do jurors really think about this to try to get everybody? Because I, I know <laughs> for a fact both clients and trial attorneys at times, they start going amygdala hijack themselves. They get into panic mode and they don't see the reality of the situation, right? And so how do you how do you talk to a client when you know in you know in your heart, let's throw a little bit of money at this. It's not like the juice is not worth the squeeze, but then you get a client going, bullshit case, we're not giving them a nickel. <laughs> how do you have that discussion to kind of get everybody back down to earth? Ultimately, our clients want us to help them manage risk. Yeah. And we have to all be cognizant that we are in an echo chamber. And in our echo chamber, most of us have a great deal of formal education. Okay. What we do is try and talk to everyone in the community we can confidentially about the facts of the case um, certain themes that we see plaintiff's counsel trying to advance uh, and clients expect us to quickly identify, for lack of a better phrase, the dogs. So yeah. when you identify the dog, when you the hear dog. the barking, it, it falls to you to start waving your arms and saying, hey, um, here's what we see so let's let's get let's let's help everyone walk outside that echo chamber yeah. and talk to someone who is a brilliant person and has say you know eight or nine years of formal education okay so we can all look in the medical world at what is sound medicine or good medicine mm -hmm. but there are cases that we might look and say hey but this is a problem because there's this particular issue. It's the a optics. theme. Yeah, it's the an optics. optic. And, and, and you've got to really lead people outside that echo chamber to have a serious discussion about how the person who would be your fact finder, who's not inside that echo chamber, is thinking and is viewing you know, this particular fact that may have absolutely no relevance factually to the medicine at issue or yeah. the person, you know the cause for the personal injury and so i think by and large most of our clients have come to understand the value yep. in, in having that discussion and listening for when we're signaling that and it really falls to us to know uh to gain that information yeah. and then to wave the flag once uh it's been raised yeah th there's a lot of cases um I work on, and, and as you know, uh, rare, rarely, this is unfortunate, but it's just it's the way the world works. Um, rarely is a med mal case really about medicine. And we, we, we so uh, we have helped many of our clients, again, usually through focus group research, when they know they have a very solid medical case, but something optically, right? Something perceptually is not off. And we had a case recently in which, like you're looking at it, at the medicine and you're going, you know, we're all good. But then it's like this physician, you know, did this particular surgery and wrote the post-op note 2.5 weeks later. Mm -hmm. And then once the lawsuit was filed, went back into the system and edited the note. Mm -hmm. It's like, mm -hmm. what are you doing? What are you doing? 
Yeah. What do you do? And obviously the, the doctor strictly just panicked, wanted to go back, cross every T, dot every I. Mm -hmm. And so now the entity's like, you know, we've got a great case on the medicine. Trial attorney is like, oh, this is going to look terrible. And then we actually, we did a focus group on that. And the jury went bananas over mm -hmm. this and just, they were, they just did not like that. And as one of those, again, juries, juries aren't dumb. Mm -hmm. They figure they, but they do sometimes they grasp on the very simplistic things, right? And the plaintiff theme here is hey, if there's smoke, there's fire. I mean, hey, who doesn't write an op now for two and a half weeks? There's a competence issue there. And then, secondly, who goes yeah. back into the note after the lawsuit and edits the note, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so they ended up mm -hmm. settling the case, which ended up being very, very wise. But I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of these nuclear verdicts happens is that the case assessment up front is inaccurate. Mm -hmm. And everybody's off going here when reality is really right here. And you end up figuring this out the hard way in front of the real jury. And so there's their ways. So I spent a lot of time doing this for clients as pretty much the wake up caller. Do you think in what you have is as good as you have, or are there some weaknesses here you're not e you're not even perceiving because um, you know you're not aware <laughs> of what a, a real um, of a, a real jury uh, thinks. Do you, now, have you have you guys used jury research and that type of? Because listen, when I when I got into this field, every mock trial, every focus group was within three months of trial date. Now we've really backed up that timeline because we have figured out. And clients have said, we need to know, like, I don't need to know, I have a shitty case 90 days before trial. I need to know that two years before trial. <laughs> and so what we're trying to do at Courtroom Sciences is provide folks like you, your clients with ammunition going into the mediation process so that you can wheel and deal and hopefully get the case resolved. Is what, What's your philosophy, I guess, uh, I'll start with Kristen, I'm just kind of early proactive intervention on cases versus kind of the, the the reactive model, which is pretty much basically the traditional insurance defense model. Um, early is better. Yeah, I can tell you how many times uh, we've said the medicine's good, but the story's terrible. Yeah. Story so is where we're stuck and plaintiffs get to present a story and we're left having to explain it away. And the less things we have to explain away, the stronger, better position we're in. And I can appreciate the uh, the later model because when nobody wants to shell out a lot of money. So yeah. putting money into focus groups or mock trials, that's a lot of money. And so sometimes carriers drag their feet on that because they are like, well, do we really have to do it? But the fact of the matter is that investment is is important. And sometimes it can be important if you have a reluctant doctor who wants to go to trial no matter what. And that can be, you have to sell it to them yep. and that sort of thing. And it really comes down to prep. And it sounds yep. so like old school, but you got to prep. Like you got to you have to ask them the hard questions and say, listen, this is how it's going to look. So let's mm -hmm. ask you the hard questions and watch them squirm and make them feel yeah. unfortunately small and build them, you know, and knock them down so they can see where the pitfalls are. And candidly, I mean, I know mock trials are used. I personally like focus groups because yeah, sure. unless you're going outside for your mock trial and then you really have to have people prep, I can't tell you how many times I felt let down when I've done a mock trial and I won. No, no, yeah. I don't want to win. The best. You want to lose. <laughs> exactly. I want to lose and I want to lose big. And yes. I want to have a big discussion as to why we're losing big. So I feel like focus groups can really be key. I mean, we had a focus group not too long ago and we had two days of more than, yeah, I don't need 20 or 20 to 30 people. And they stayed engaged and active and involved the whole time. And we got so much great information and we showed them everything, the good, the bad, the ugly, what we knew was going to be a problem. And doing yeah. that early is key. It's the key. And there are yeah. ways to do it. Uh, we have come up with a, a, some new formats that are extraordinarily cost because I cost is number one barrier to these clients and I get it. So we developed some 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 formats that are uh, e extremely affordable, and we have clients now. Get ready for this, just to put a bug in here. We have clients doing these pre-suit on certain mm -hmm. cases, pre-suit because they know what happened. Mm -hmm. They know what happened, and you don't. Yeah, again, you don't need an eight-hour focus group on every. No, you could do it in two hours. You do it in four hours, and you know the basic facts. And to get information as early as possible, I really think leads to to bear decision-making. Um, close to wrapping up here. 
something that makes me nuts. And if you've listened to the podcast, one of the things that I typically do is I, every podcast, I go on what I call my rant. I go on my rant and I'm going to go on a rant right now. And this is a rant I've gone on multiple times during the podcast. And I'm going to do it again because it keeps freaking happening. Is I get a call. It, ha it happened yesterday. It happened yesterday. Get a call from a law firm who who we know. We've been working with this law, law firm for 10 years. And they call and they're like, we have a trial on December 9th. We need this. We need the, the, the and I'm looking, I'm looking at, I'm like December 9th, 2025, 26. Like, what, you mean December 9th and like four and a half weeks, December 9th. They're like, yeah. M makes me absolutely insane. Okay. Now I want to juxtapose that next to something I've heard countless trial attorneys and law firms market themselves as. And I think it's complete horseshit. I'm going to tell you right now. They say, well, when each case comes in, we work every case up as if it was going to trial from day one. And I'm like, get the, get out of here. Get, <laughs> that's not true. That's not true. Because if it was, you, you wouldn't be calling me four and a half weeks before your trial date. Um, what, what's the, fir Jason, what's the firm's philosophy on readiness? Because I do, not get back to nuclear verdicts. I think another huge, massive issue, when you look at all these bad verdicts, kind of the story is the same. You had an unprepared lack of readiness on the defense side, and you had a plaintiff's firm that was ready to go. Oh, yeah. And you can't, yeah. you know, you got the big game coming up, and one team practices every day. The other team has three practices under their belt. It's, you're not going to win that game. What's your guys' philosophy on that? So they're highly selective on the cases that they're choosing to file in the first place, Yep. as opposed to the volume on the defense side. Yes. So our philosophy very much goes along, I think, with what we were talking about earlier, which is identifying which track a case belongs on. If it's a settled track, you don't work that case up the same way you do if it's going for trial. You're throwing it toward mediation. You're throwing it toward settlement. You're getting those matters. And I do have a client that has an early identification and resolution program. Nice. Okay. So nice. I, I think the carriers and some of the entities are starting to get that. And they don't want a giant bill for every matter to be worked up as if it's going to trial. But when you know that thing is going for trial, that's all hands on deck, that's early, that's several conversations with leadership, the powers that be, the client is carefully and closely involved at every stage, at every step. We're bringing witness prep in early. We're focus grouping it early. We're taking that data and we're figuring out what are our themes. Because the other side is going to be using a set of themes at trial that we've got to refute at every expert deposition with every fact witness who gets deposed. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that that's just a different set of, of steps. The staging of that is different. And the other side has no diff has no yep. knowledge which case is which. Yep. OK, Very but we internally have to and the client has to. Yeah, it's a it's a big, big issue. Okay, final question. I'm going to work through all three of you. And this is a question that's dear to my heart because I think it's really, really important. Uh, and that's really the topic of um, burnout. Uh, you know, it's a, you guys are in a rough field. I am not in your field, but I'm right next to you. Um, Jeff, what do you do to, because the grind can, uh, it's called the grind for a reason, right? It's not all rainbows and sunshine, right? Uh, what do you do personally? I mean, I'm big. I'm a big time. Like I just go to the, I go to the gym. I put my headphones in and I lift heavy things until it hurts. And then I rest for two minutes and then I keep, I, then I do it. Again. I do it again because I have got to work out, release some steam and everybody does things different. I try to, I try to protect my sleep and eat well and stuff like that. What are some of the specific things that you do to protect your mind and your body in a pretty stressful uh, industry that you're in? I think it's staying balanced and staying, staying disciplined. Um, I, I love the gym too. And I love, I go for walks. You know, I try to, even when I'm in the office here, we're right by the, the water, the river here. And I go down and I'll take a 15 minute walk. 
um, at lunch lunchtime. You know, I usually eat lunch at the desk, but I'll go out and I'll walk. Um, just getting a walk in every day. Um, I definitely have to eat better, but I think it's staying disciplined, staying balanced, not not doing too much of, of anything, just sort of having a little bit of everything, working mm-hmm. out, decent sleep, um, decent diet. Um, and I preface all that with, I just had a newborn uh, in early <laughs> September. So it's been, uh, but the firm's been great and, and uh, um, no, we're making it through. Yeah, congratulations or my condolences. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, I remember those days. My, mine are both six foot tall now and, and drive, so I'm, I'm a little different. But congratulations. And yeah, keep taking care of your health. Uh, Kristen, same thing. How do you, what, what maybe little tricks do you have to maintain just mental health and physical health? Because if you can really get sucked into this job and it can just, it can rule your life. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I've fallen into that, but I will say um, that balance balance is there. So um, I I'm active in my kids' school, and I have three boys, so I'm president of the PTO. And I'm that's more wait, Kristen. That's I said decrease stress, and (laughs) and, and okay, maybe you misunderstood my question, (laughs) Council. Let me restate the question because you're doing things to increase stress. Are you out of your mind? My wife does that. She does that in the HOA. Yeah. It's like my house is nothing but drama. She just comes home and I'm going, oh God, this is like, you're, you're killing my life, honey. Like I'm trying to decrease my stress. You know, I can see how that would be very fun uh, being involved uh, in, in the kids school and, and doing kids stuff as well. Yeah. So, so there's that. And I, I do, uh, I, I do, I get as much outside time as I can with my yard and my dog and, you know, and I like crafts. So that's where the PTO, nice. it allows me to, do things that are simple and not super complicated, but it improves the community. And I yeah. like that feedback because it's easy to fall into being an island. Yes. And you just go to work and go home and go to work and go home. So that's a tough thing. So another thing, another thing that I like to do, which people make fun of me, I love it. My wife loves it. I great stress and it's mindless because you, you you can't look at your phone. I love the clean. Mm-hmm. I love the clean. I love the clean. I I wash dishes. I will wipe wipe down counters. I love. I'll pressure wa- pressure washing, best thing in the world, because you can't have your damn phone or laptop with you. You you just have to focus on pressure washing. Just something where you're you're just giving your your mind a break. And then we'll we'll end with uh, Jason and wrap up. Go ahead, Jason. Oh, I've got a uh, small hobby farm with a greenhouse. I love to keep my hands in dirt and propagate plants. Uh, I've got three herding dogs and a small classic car collection and turning a wrench can be very therapeutic. There you, I'm not allowed to touch tools and my, I wasn't, I'm not one of those guys. Uh, my father uh, took off when I was young. So I, I, I was raised by my mother. Um, so I'm a very good cleaner. I like, I'm the guy I, I shit you not. I shit you not. This is when, when, I, when this is a while ago, my kids are younger. I would ruin every Christmas morning because I would attempt to put these damn toys together and I would F it, I would F it up. Right. And I would, I ruin the, toy. my kids would be crying. Like I am literally not allowed to touch wrenches, maybe a screwdriver occasionally. If I'm like hanging a picture, that's all, but man. And then it's so I was like, I'm not allowed to do that. I'm glad that you actually know um, what you're doing, but the plant thing's interesting. Don't, don't always my point. Yeah. <laughs> no, don't always know. You can make a lot of mistakes, but that just gives you more opportunity to get back in there and, and learn. Try and look at diagrams on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you, I spend uh, hours on YouTube just trying to learn new things. And so I have, uh, I call it my Serenity Porch, and I have all my plants. Thing is, I travel a lot, and then of course my family doesn't water my plants while I'm gone. They kill all my plants, Jason. <laughs> There's nothing worse than coming home from an eight day road trip and you go on your mm-hmm. Serenity Porch, and all, all your goddamn plants are dead. <laughs> right? It's not a greenhouse anymore; it's a brown house. <laughs> And it's like, what do, what do you, like, I give you guys one job to do and you can't even water my plants. So I, I've got to work on the family with that, but listen, guys, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. This was an exceptional uh, discussion. Thank you for sharing all your thoughts. Uh, I think this was really, really great. We hope to do more of these uh, with other firms. Hang on. Cause I want to chat with you guys after to our audience. Thank you for listening to this edition of the litigation psychology podcast brought to you by courtroom sciences. We'll see you next time.